we're coming on the air with some new developments in the war in Ukraine, and they're all connected by one thing, one warning, one fear, that it's probably going to get worse. Coming up, why more U.S. troops are now heading overseas to help NATO allies, and the concern that a frustrated, stalled Russia might step up long-range attacks like this one. The scary moment a missile hit the ground just outside Kyiv. We'll take you live to Ukraine to explain why one top official tells me the refugees they're seeing are more and more traumatized. And then here at home, you've got Congress pushing to ban Russian oil and the markets. Look at the big board taking a nosedive on all this uncertainty. Plus, we'll go deeper on what the White House is saying now about WNBA star Brittany Griner detained in Russia for going on three weeks now. Her wife calling this one of the weakest moments of her life. Plus, Bill Cosby, he's going to stay a free man for now, with the Supreme Court declining to hear a case about the actor's overturned sex assault conviction. Remember that? But one victim's attorney says the decision doesn't surprise her. We'll explain why. And as America's biggest city drops mask rules today overseas, it's looking more like COVID 1.0 in Hong Kong. We're going to take you there. Plus, an exclusive look at how the CDC is deciding what the new normal will look like in this country. A behind-the-scenes look at how NBC News got to go behind the scenes in tonight's backstory later on in the show. Hey, I'm Hallie. And today, a senior defense official is saying just about every soldier that Russia had planned to use in Ukraine is now there with the focus now on trying to get innocent people out of the way of danger and the real concern it's getting to be too late. And, you know, we're going to tell this story through one town's story, Irpin. It's a suburb of about 60,000 people. It's only 15 miles or so right in the center of Kiev, just outside it. You can see it on the map here. And people are desperate to get out. They're so desperate that they're tiptoeing across this I don't know, you can't even call it a bridge. It's held together by nails and prayers, basically, after Ukrainians blew up the main bridge to try and slow down Russian troops. The streets are torn up. Getting out by car is super tough. Look at that. So folks have to walk, carrying bags of whatever they have, dealing with moments like the one we're about to show you, captured on camera when a missile hit. And a warning, it's tough to watch. That's what it's like across Ukraine. You do not know what's coming next, including in Mariupol, a city in the south surrounded by Russian troops. And look at this. You can see the smoke coming up from buildings. The United Nations says more than 400 innocent people, civilians, are dead. But experts think we're going to hear about more casualties as this drags on. And here at home, you have the U.S. apparently collecting evidence of possible war crimes by Russia. Just as House Speaker Nancy Pelosi says the U.S. is looking into this bipartisan ban on Russian oil imports. We're going to talk more about the movement on that front, what it might mean for you and your gas prices coming up in a second. But we start on the ground with Cal Perry in Lviv. And Cal, let me start with the civilians, right, and these so-called humanitarian passageways that Russia is proposing. Because, you know, in Russia, they're saying, hey, there's going to be a ceasefire to get civilians out. But a Ukrainian official says you can you can hardly call them humanitarian passageways. They're more like propaganda corridors because they're funneling people back to Russia. So what's going on? Yeah, exactly that. I mean, you had a dozen or so, quote unquote, corridors that were supposed to open up throughout the day, um, and 11 of them led to Russia or Belarus. Um, And it, you know, if if you're a Ukrainian civilian, you're not trying to flee to Russia. You're trying to flee the other direction. You're trying to flee where I am. On top of that, and you you showed that video, there's no trust amongst civilians that these humanitarian corridors are going to be safe when they're constantly shelled. And that's the other thing that we're seeing, is that we're seeing folks try to make a break for it, try to get out of these cities that have been surrounded where the power has been cut off, where there's no more water, where there's no more heat, people making a run for it, and then they're being targeted. And so folks are more likely to stay where they are. In fact, my colleague, Rich, colleague Richard Engel was reporting today that folks in the suburb of Kiev were actually moving closer into the city, that they were going into the more urban areas to try to bunker down there because they just didn't trust that these corridors yeah. would function properly, Hallie. So these quote-unquote peace talks, it feels like they're just that, quote-unquote, right, between Russia and Ukraine. There are so few signs of progress that it's really kind of hard to hard to assess at this point. 
And it's hard to figure out exactly what's being discussed. It's leaking sort of from both sides. I think the Ukrainian government feels like they need to show people that they're willing to sit down and talk with the Russians, that they're open to a ceasefire, even if there's no trust there. And then on the Russian side, you have the Russian delegation saying, we're trying to look out for civilians, we're trying to take care of these civilian populations. But again, not only is there a lack of trust, there's also a lack of what it is that we are talking about. Some of the Russian delegation today leaked out to some of the Russian media that they were talking about the Constitution here in Ukraine. And maybe Ukraine would never agree to join NATO and never agree to join Europe. And so what is the point, is right. what you're going to hear from the Ukrainian side. If we can't even agree on what we're talking about, if we can't even agree on a framework, sort of what are we doing here? The other piece of this, Cal, and I keep coming back to this, and I think a lot of people do because it is so visceral, it's the kids, right? It's these children. And this new U.N. warning today yeah. about some of them coming across unaccompanied. There are concerns about that. We know that many of the refugees coming across the border, you know, are children, Cal. Yeah, half. I mean, we're hearing from the UN, it's about half yeah. are just kids um, streaming across. And that's a combination of things. You've got fathers staying behind uh, to fight, forcibly uh, being forced to stay behind. Um, and some of these folks are now ending up in orphanages. I mean, this was a dark moment, I think, in this conflict this weekend when an orphanage here opened in the city of Lviv because it's just an indication yeah. that a lot of these parents are not making it out of these cities and kids are. We're hearing these. Um, gutting stories of kids being given notes, handwritten notes with a phone number to reach other relatives and a cell phone and, and being sh you know, pushed across the border and are crossing alone. Um, and that is something that is, of course, awful and will continue and the numbers will only get worse. You know, add to that, there is now a food crisis here in this country. The World Food Program saying five million people are in need of immediate assistance. Again, more than half of those are going to be children, Hallie. Cal Perry, live for us in Lviv. Cal, thank you for being on the ground for us there. About 90 minutes before we were coming on the air here, we got new details on the 500 troops that are temporarily heading over to Europe, to Poland, to Romania, to Germany. You got some aircraft going to Greece, too. You can see it on the map here. Basically, to help protect NATO airspace, to resupply, to help with logistics. And when you talk about what's going on in the air, you have the Biden administration that's been more and more these last 24 hours opening the door to backfill jets to, say, Poland, if that country decides to send its planes to help Ukraine. Here's how Press Secretary John Kirby explained it. What we've said is that, uh, that this would be a sovereign decision for a nation state to make, whether it's Poland or anybody else. There was discussion about if a nation such as Poland were to do this, uh, would there be a capacity for the United States to backfill those aircraft with American-made aircraft? I want to bring in Pentagon correspondent Courtney Kuby, who's with us tonight. So, Court, you know, when I've talked to experts about this, even just today, there seems to be this mixed messaging or a mixed opinion bag, you could say. Some say this is a shiny object, backfilling jets to Poland. Poland even ha hasn't even said we want to send planes to Ukraine re yet, right? Others say you've got to do every single thing you can, get those MiGs over there. What's the real deal? So there's a whole lot of issues here. Yes, Poland has not said that they want to send them. In fact, there have been some statements out of the Polish government that are on the contrary to that, that they do not want to send jets to Ukraine. But let's assume that, they, that Poland did want to, that Ukraine wanted to accept these fighter jets, that Ukraine could accept the fighter jets. Where's the U.S. component to that? So members of Congress are saying the United States needs to backfill, needs to make sure that Poland is protected by providing F-16s. Well, that's not as easy as it sounds. There's not like it's not like the United States has this inventory of F-16s that are sitting around that they can grab. You can't run down to Walmart and pick some up and send them over to Poland. So it may not be that easy. There are a lot of logistical issues. Press Secretary Jen Psaki at the White House actually was pretty open about that at her briefing today, saying that not only is the issue of having to backfill, which, by the way, can take years for these major aircraft and weapon systems to be, to be you know, built and sent over, but there's also the issue of the logistics of doing just that. And what that means is, how would they get the, the MiGs, the, po the Polish fighter jets, into Ukraine safely. It's a contested airspace. That's right. What were to happen? What would happen if they were flying them over and Russia shot them down? You know, so there's a whole lot of logistical issues that would have to be worked out. The, the, at the end of the day, though, Hallie, the Biden administration is looking into this, but it's a very, very early in the process and a bureaucratic process that rarely moves quickly. I mean, you talk about logistics, even like the runways to get these planes on and off, right? In the airports, and you know, yes. Russians have been targeting some of those spots. There was also something really interesting today, Courtney, and we've been hearing more and more about this. What you're talking about right now is the Ukrainian resistance, right? How much can the Ukrainians put up a fight against Russia? But on the Russian side, you had the Pentagon making these allusions to indications about 
morale being low in Russian troops, right? And this is something that's developed more and more as they're struggling with, apparently, according to the U.S., food and fuel and supplies. And, like, listen, not psyched to be in this fight. That's right. And some of them weren't, specifically the conscripts, the people who are who are not career military for the Russian military. Many of them, according to U.S. officials, didn't know that they were going over there to fight in the first place. And I, you have to imagine, you know, you're a young volunteer, you know, on most of them on a one-year term, uh, and you go to Ukraine and you're faced with people who— Probably many of them may even seem like Russians. They may seem very similar to them, and they don't really understand. They weren't told that they were going to be meeting a resistance or fighting a war. So there are a lot of reports. Some are anecdotal, but some are backed up by U.S. intelligence that they that that Russian forces there's low morale in some of the conscript forces. They are, as you said, they're suffering in some places with problems with their resupply. We hear a lot about this convoy yeah, that's been moving down stuck. towards Kiev. Yeah, that's a resupply convoy. I think that's another thing people may not know. It's not it's yes there are some military tanks and things yeah. that are in that 40 mile convoy but most of that it was actually an effort to get supplies down for the battle to surround and ultimately take Kiev. Right. So that is just it, it's actually become very symbolic of the Russian offense here and that is in the north in the east they're really meeting with logistical hurdles and with now some morale problems. Courtney Q be live for us at the Pentagon uh, on another long day, and I know long night for you, Court. Thank you. So all of this, everything we're talking about that's happening overseas, is affecting the markets too here in the United States. And today, worst loss, worst daily loss since this Ukraine invasion began. Look at this: the Dow was down something like 800 points today. The S and P 128 down. It's worst day actually since last October. And then the Nasdaq was down 482 points. Why? Well, investors are worried that you might see higher energy prices, even more than we've already seen, that could slow down the economy and raise inflation. I want to bring in now Christina Partsinevelos. Um, Christina, there's this term that I know our friends at CNBC and you like to say, which is we're tiptoeing to correction territory. What does that mean? How significant is this? A correction territory means when markets fall 10 percent from their most recent high. Another term we also use is bear market territory. So that is when markets drop 20 percent from their most recent high. And the best way visually, a bear is like this. That's why it's going down. And uh, unfortunately, with the Nasdaq, where I am right now, we are 20 percent off of those most recent highs. So in bear market territory, we did see a sell off today. You mentioned that a lot of that stems around the consumer of oil prices climbing higher. There was a Bank of America note that said that every time one million barrels of oil is off the market from Russia, we could potentially see the price jump by $20, which is why so many people today were just throwing around $200 barrels, you know, saying it could potentially hit that uh, level. And if it does, that means we are all going to have to pay more for goods because everyone, every company uses oil as their inputs to, to ship goods, to bring goods across the border, you name it. And so that's the reason why there are a lot of concerns about inflation yeah. and it weighed heavily on markets today. Christina Parts and Evelos, good to see you from the NASDAQ. Appreciate it. So what she's talking about here, right, relates to what the White House is talking about and thinking about and what they're thinking about over on Capitol Hill. And that's energy, Russian oil, and this question of, should the U.S. ban imports of Russian oil? The White House is saying today, hey, no decision. But the head of the Intelligence Committee is telling NBC, maybe we'll see it in the next 24 to 36 hours. You've got Democrats and Republicans on the Hill who want to really turn up the pressure on the Russian economy, and they think this is a step that the U.S. should take. Here's a little bit of a context check for you, though. Russian oil only makes up, like, less than 10 percent of U.S. imports, right? Not much, but you've got the White House. It's been pretty open about it's worried if they take this step, gas prices could spike even more, even more than what you're seeing now. Yes, that says 7.59 at a gas station in Gorda, California. It's not like that everywhere, but it gives you a bit of a sense, at least in that one location, all because crude oil prices are the highest they've been in 13 years. I want to bring in Peter Alexander over at the White House. And, Peter, what's interesting to me is that when you talk to some experts on this, they'll say oh, this, some of them say this feels like a no-brainer, we have to. But the White House perspective is, listen, this whole time we've been in lockstep with our allies. Our allies overseas in Europe get way more Russian oil than we do. Right. They're a little more hesitant to take this step. Yeah, Hallie, you're exactly right. I mean, we it's about 3.5 percent of our oil in total that we use comes from Russia. It's about a third of the oil import, imports 
for Europe right now. So it's highly significant for them. And that's why it's a much bigger step. And it's why even before the president spoke today with the leaders of uh, the UK, with Germany and with um, and with some other leaders as well, Macron of France, that we heard from some of those leaders saying that they believe they agree that their countries, that Europe needs to sort of phase away from its dependence on Russian oil, but they said they are in no position to enforce a Russian oil embargo right now. It would just be too damaging to them. So as you noted for President Biden, it's a not too dissimilar situation with smaller percentages, as you noted there. The White House saying that if in effect they're trying to juggle what is this punishment, this penalty for Vladimir Putin with what would be an extension of the pain that Americans are already feeling at the pump right now. But as you note, lawmakers, a bipartisan group of lawmakers, they are ratcheting up that pressure to say nothing of what you're already hearing from Vladimir Zelensky, who again today said that Russian oil should be banned, yes. that those European and American and America should ban that oil from coming in. But those bipartisan lawmakers are effectively working on legislation right now that would ban trade with Russia and Belarus and also would ban energy products from Russia, Hallie. I am struck, though, when I hear from, for example, Senator Joe Manchin, as you know, a moderate Democrat, who will say, supporting this, well, Americans will bear the cost of higher gas prices yeah. because it's the fight for democracy, right? It's the fight to get Ukrainians out of this war overseas. I, I got to tell you, Peter, I'm not so sure that the White House is making that same calculation. Clearly, they have some hesitation on that front when it comes to a purely political perspective. And that is a part of this year. You have President Biden in this new Quinnipiac poll that's out within just the last 45 Five minutes, I think, showing his approval rating in the high 30s, but he gets better marks on his handling of the Ukraine crisis, right? People, I think Americans, we're seeing the numbers, are appreciating what he's doing at the moment. The White House has got to weigh all this, plus the markets, as we just talked about, as they're making yeah. their decisions. Yeah, no, you're right. He does get better marks than his overall approval rating as it relates to Ukraine, but there's still more Americans dissatisfied with his handling yep. of Ukraine even than they are satisfied with it right now. So Americans are frustrated broadly right now. There is that collective malaise even as we come out of the COVID crisis. They're now watching this situation. They were already dealing with inflation and these gas prices as a function of what's going on overseas in Russia and Ukraine is only making that situation worse. So you hate to look at this through the strictly political lens, but obviously the Democrats who control both houses of Congress and the White House fear that they would be the ones ultimately who bore the brunt of Americans' frustration this fall during the midterms if inflation remains this high and certainly if gas prices are that high as well. You said the average price of a gallon right now, more than $4. In California, it's more than $5. These are numbers that are on par effectively with what we saw back in 2008, almost 15 years ago mm -hmm. right now. And this is a pocketbook issue. It's a as tangible as any other because you drive past those gas stations every day and as we speak to drivers around the country right now they're acknowledging they want there to be a punishment for Russia but they're concerned for their own economic well-being as well. It's that tightrope uh, that the White House has got to walk. Peter Alexander on the White House North Lawn. Good to see you Peter. Thanks for being on. We just found out that about half the country not too long ago just started dealing with some real severe weather threats. We're talking from Alabama up to New Jersey. Big storms, major winds, maybe even a few tornadoes, all of it affecting more than 37 million people. It's part of the storm that caused those deadly tornadoes in Iowa over the weekend, same system. Seven people, including two kids, died near Des Moines after multiple tornadoes ripped through the state. Officials say it was the deadliest storm that Iowa has seen in more than a decade. And these tornadoes created this, like, 70-mile path of destruction. Look at this. Tore down dozens of homes, knocked down trees, knocked down power lines. At one point, more than 10,000 customers were out of power near Des Moines. You've got FEMA, the feds going in, they're looking at the damage there. They're trying to see what kind of help on the federal level might be needed. Al Roker is joining me now for the outlook on this. Okay, Al, where is the bad weather moving to now? What's the next bullseye? Well, it's moving here into the northeast, Allie. Uh, in fact, as we as we take a look on our radar, you can see we've got rain and showers and thunderstorms stretching all the way down from the northeast all the way down into Atlanta. And in fact, we have a severe thunderstorm watch right now for central 
parts of Pennsylvania on into northern Maryland and just uh, north of Washington, D.C. And in fact, you can see we're looking at these storms pushing through. They're moving through relatively rapidly. Uh, right now, as you mentioned, 37 million people at risk. New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Washington, back to Roanoke, Greenville, Atlanta, all under a severe risk. Uh, tornadoes not likely, isolated possible. We're really mostly worried about strong wind gusts. In fact, we have uh, high wind warnings warnings right now, uh, uh, high wind advisories, I should say, from Boston all the way back into Raleigh, Altoona, Pennsylvania, uh, New York City, 64 million people are going to be dealing with these high winds, Allie. So it's not the heavy rain. We're really more worried about the winds, maybe bringing down some power lines, and again, that isolated risk of a tornado in that risk area, Hallie. It does feel a little bit whiplashy, Al. You know, I, you know, I live in Washington here. It was like 70 degrees when I came into work today, but breaking break record. Records, I would think, or at least about to. Yeah, we are. In fact, uh, New York City's tied a record. Take a look at some of these temperatures today. Uh, feels really like spring. The calendar's probably about a month and a half ahead of time. Uh, Jacksonville almost tied, broke its record. Mobile very close. Atlanta close as well. Uh, Raleigh, uh, not quite. But as we get into the Northeast, look at this. Philadelphia breaking its record. Same in Salisbury. Washington, D.C. broke a record at 79. Uh, New York City tying that record. However, with this front pushing through, that's going to knock our temperatures back to more seasonal. Seasonal conditions, uh, mid 40s in Cleveland by the time we get toward the end of the week. Uh, Washington, there where you are, uh, 43 degrees on Wednesday after a high tomorrow of 55. And you can see those temperatures back to the west. Uh, Chicago by Thursday, 39, 19 in Minneapolis on Thursday and Omaha with temperatures 26. So winter is not quite done yet. We're still hanging in there, but things are moderating as the seesaw goes back and forth. Each time it goes up, it goes up a little higher. Allie. Al Roker, good to see you. Thank you, Al. We'll look for more of you tomorrow morning on the Today Show. Appreciate it. And other news here in Washington. The Supreme Court is not going to review the sex assault case against Bill Cosby, which means the Pennsylvania's decision to throw out his conviction, remember that, that stays in place. Cosby was convicted of aggravated indecent assault in 2018 for drugging and sexually assaulting Andrea Constant. He did almost three years in prison. But then remember what happened last June. The Pennsylvania Supreme Court overturned the conviction. At the time, the court said that he was not given protection against incriminating himself. Cosby's spokesperson today says it's a huge victory, saying his rights were subject to a, quote, reprehensible bait and switch. The former comedian became one of the first celebrities convicted of sexual assault in the Me Too era after Constant and dozens of other women accused him of inappropriate sexual behavior. Pete Williams is joining me now. So, Pete, there's a lot to this year, a lot of layers. You've got Cosby's accusers. You heard from what Cosby's spokesperson had to say. His accusers say this is a huge disappointment, um, although one of the attorneys representing one of the victims says she's not altogether surprised by this. No, I don't think this should come as any surprise at all. You know, you have to remember, the Supreme Court does not view itself as the judicial outrage correction court. Their business, as far as they're concerned, is to harmonize the law. If it's being applied differently in different parts of the country or there are major constitutional questions involved, that's when the Supreme Court would step in. But these, this was a very unique circumstance. Remember what happened here. The district attorney, the, the local prosecutor, looked at the case and said, I just don't think the evidence is strong enough. He put out a press release saying, I'm not going to prosecute right. Bill Cosby. And on the strength of that, Cosby then testified in the civil lawsuit that his accuser filed against him. And then that was unsealed. And the new prosecutor came along and used Cosby's own testimony to file new charges. Those are the ones that put him in prison. Those are the ones that the Pennsylvania Supreme Court then tossed out, saying that, you know, he had a, he, he had a, a reasonable expectation that, in essence, he'd been given an immunity deal. So does what the Supreme Court has decided now have any bearing on the civil suit that's been brought against Cosby? So uh, Hallie Jackson fans take note. It's not a Supreme Court decision. They haven't decided anything. Okay, okay. All, that's... All, all they did is just said, we're not going to hear this case. Fine. It has no precedential value. It doesn't mean anything. It just, as far as the U.S. Supreme Court is concerned, it doesn't exist. Decision with a small d, right? To move. Supreme Court move, I guess, is what I meant. <laughs> Action, whatever. <laughs> yes. I mean, it has. it's going to have no effect it. in any other case. It's because... 
this again, these these circumstances are so unusual. The idea that this would arise anywhere else, okay. and I think that's one of the reasons why the Supreme Court isn't taking this case up. So that was my question to you. Could we extrapolate from this down the road? It feels like yeah. no, because this is right. such a unique and specific set of circumstances around Bill Cosby. Precisely. And the other thing to remember, of course, as you know, is that the idea that there could be any other criminal charges against Cosby for all these various accusations. We're pretty well down the road where the, the statute of limitations has expired for those. And so then there are other potential civil lawsuits that he could face. But this whole case about the specifics of what happened here yeah. and whether he had immunity or not, I mean, they just don't apply in any of these other civil trials. So this was really about this one case only. And I think that's why the Supreme Court didn't take the case. Pete Williams uh, on set here with us. Appreciate you doing that. Thank you, you Pete. Coming up, COVID chaos in Hong Kong. You've got cases in the city surging. Tighter and tighter restrictions. We're going to take you to China for the surprising latest. Plus... New satellite pictures from North Korea have some analysts worried that the country could start testing nuclear bombs again. We'll explain why later in the hour. So in parts of China, it's looking kind of like the early worst days of the pandemic from two years ago, with a scientist in Hong Kong saying it's, quote, an unprecedented health crisis. We're talking about some of the highest numbers since the very first outbreak in Wuhan at the end of 2019. And all of it's happening, even with China's whole zero COVID strategy, as they call it, that requires quarantines when even just a few cases are found. Now you've got the government planning to launch mandatory mass testing. And we're seeing some scenes there, like what we saw here in the U.S. a couple years ago, empty store shelves long lines for things that people need, so much uncertainty. Janice Mackey Freyer is joining us now from our Beijing bureau. And Janice, I just am struck by the images that we're seeing that look so much like COVID 1.0, two and a half years into this pandemic. <laughs> Welcome back to 2020. Uh, they're calling it the fifth wave in Hong Kong. Uh, consistently, there have been uh, 50,000 cases a day, and that's a lot when you consider that the population of the island is roughly seven and a half million. Um, it's, they're feeling overwhelmed there, especially the hospitals, because with this zero COVID strategy that officials there are aiming for, every positive case is admitted to the hospital, goes into the system. As well, there has been a rise in the death toll there, and that's creating a lot of panic and a lot of uncertainty, which is why we're seeing people stockpiling. Some stores have had to impose a, a rationing system for some items like rice and canned goods, as well as medications. Um, people there are blaming mixed messaging over the zero COVID strategy, uh, but experts say that it needs to get under control because the concern now, beyond reputational damage to Hong Kong as a financial hub, the real concern for a lot of people is that a mainland-style total lockdown yeah. could be coming. You talk about that uncertainty. You've got people, you know, concerns that people may not be reporting positive tests because of exactly this issue, having to be separated from families, having to go into some of these really restricted and isolated places. Well, that's what zero COVID means, Hallie. It means that if there is a positive case, that positive case is separated uh, from their family, put into the hospital, put into the system for treatment. It doesn't matter how old that positive case is. There are stories of toddlers wow. being separated from their families so they can be treated in the hospital. And, the, and that, that creates a whole other <laughs> traumatic situation for a lot of families. Um, there's also a, a lot of distrust among people for the government. And as well, the elderly haven't been getting vaccinated because they've been uh, hearing all of these rumors of possible side effects. So you have nursing homes with an 80% infection rate. And experts say until until that gets under control, this uh, spread of Omicron is not going to stop. Uh, and again, a lot of the concern is that with the numbers mounting and with Hong Kong officials wanting to come in line with this zero COVID strategy that the mainland expects, that there is going to be a total lockdown. I'll give you a quick example of how it works with, with medications under a zero COVID system. I can't go to a pharmacy or a store to buy ibuprofen or cough syrup or fever medication, anything that might suggest that somebody has a symptom of COVID-19, you have to go to what's called a government fever clinic in order to get an appointment, to be checked out, 
to get a prescription for ibuprofen or cough syrup before you can actually go and fill that prescription. And even to get to a fever clinic, you need to have a negative COVID test. So this is the sort of system that's already in place in the mainland. This is the sort of system that people in Hong Kong are concerned is going to come about as officials try to bring the rules in line with the mainland and also to bring those numbers down. Janice Mackey Fryer live for us there overseas. Janice, it's great to see you. Thank you. Uh, keep us updated, please. We want to get to some breaking news now. Reports of a school shooting in Des Moines, Iowa. It happened at East High School and the Associated Press says that police say that three people are being held. Vaughn Hilliard has been following this story and joins us now. Vaughn, I know that this is all breaking, this is all developing as we speak. Bring us up to speed on what we know for sure here. Yeah, Hallie, what we know for sure here at this time is that per the Des Moines Police Department, there were three teenagers who were shot and are in critical condition here at this hour. This happened this afternoon at East High School in Des Moines. To give you an idea, that is just about, uh, about one mile from where the Iowa State Capitol is at here. Uh, the school uh, was in session at the time. The students were ultimately let go from their lockdown situation and released. The police are saying here at this time that they uh, have multiple individuals, potential suspects, here detained. But I think this speaks to the greater concerns here about shootings. You know, when we're talking about even Des Moines specifically, the number of shootings in Des Moines proper in 2021 doubling from 2020. Again, we are still just in the beginning stages here yeah. of understanding what happened in this particular instance here. But you heard from President Biden uh, just last week calling for uh, federal action on uh, gun control, gun regulations. But you have not seen that over the course of years and mass shootings. Last uh, year, the Washington Post, a database, actually calculated there were 42 school shootings last year. There's already four here this year now with three, these three young individuals shot outside of Des Moines uh, High School here. But again, we're in the early stages of understanding the extent of this situation. And do we, I just want to be clear, Vaughn, on the condition of these students that you're talking about. Critical? Is that, am I correct? Critical condition is okay. our understanding at this hour here from the local police who are okay. on scene at this time, Allie. It is. Uh, Devastating to hear about, and I know you'll stay on top of this one, Vaughn, and bring us any updates as you get them. Thank you. Thanks. Let's get you over now to the five things our team thinks you should know about tonight. Number one, let's start with some new satellite pictures showing signs maybe that North Korea could be planning to start testing nuclear bombs again. Analysts say the images show new buildings and construction at the country's nuclear testing site. Look at, I mean, that's what you're seeing in these squares, the highlighted parts of these images. You don't have to be a nuclear expert to be able to look at that, right? There's a lot of concern about this, especially because North Korea said it destroyed that site back in 2018. Number two, federal prosecutors today told jurors during closing arguments that Guy Reffitt was ecstatic about what he did when he tried to storm the Capitol while armed on January 6th, they say. Reffitt is the first defendant to take his case to trial. Both sides have rested, and the jury is expected to start deliberations tomorrow. We'll be on verdict watch for that. Number three, a convoy of truckers are circled around D.C. today because of COVID mandates. Day two of protests on the Beltway. They're not nearly what we saw in Ottawa in Canada, but demonstrators say they want to get lawmakers' attention on this issue. Number four, Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas wants to take a closer look at giving sites like Facebook broad immunity. He says he wants the high court to tighten up protections for social media platforms when they're used to commit crimes. His comments are coming after the court declined to take up an appeal from a Texas woman who was sex trafficked at 15 after find friending her abuser on Facebook. And number five, did you hear about this? The NFL just suspending Falcons wide receiver Calvin Ridley for the 2022 season because he was betting on games last year, they say. The gambling apparently happened during a five-day stretch when Ridley spent time away from the team, citing mental health reasons. Ridley can try to seek reinstatement, can try to get back on the team next February, or within the next few days, he can try to appeal, see what happens there. Turning back to Ukraine, we talked about at the top of the show the U.S., according to officials, collecting evidence of potential Russian war crimes. With the National Security Council spokesperson telling NBC they will use every tool available, including criminal prosecutions, if it gets to that point. And you know the world's also watching, with the International Criminal Court opening an investigation into those allegations, specifically on the weapons Russia might be using. So we're breaking down exactly what those weapons are. Watch. This is brutality. 
This is inhumane. The head of NATO on Friday claiming Russia is using so-called cluster bombs in its invasion of Ukraine. And the international NGO Human Rights Watch saying Russia killed civilians by firing these bombs into Kharkiv, accusing them of violating international humanitarian law. They cited a 2010 U.N. treaty banning these weapons, although it's not signed by Russia, Ukraine, or for that matter, the United States. But what exactly are cluster bombs? Basically, they're rockets that open up in the air and let out smaller bombs that can hit a bunch of targets at once over a big area. But a lot of times, they don't explode when they hit the ground. So rescue teams, like this one in Syria, have to clean up a threat that can last for a long time after the fighting. Russia's also accused of using vacuum bombs, sometimes called thermobaric weapons, like these the country has used in practice. Basically, it sucks up all the oxygen where it's detonated, creating a huge fireball and devastating the area. The Kremlin denies using any cluster or thermobaric weapons, and a senior U.S. defense official says they cannot confirm or deny their use. But some experts looking at the devastation call it like they see it. When you fire artillery into residential areas, when you bomb civilians, when you attack a nuclear power plant, you are committing war crimes. Mm -hmm. And Ukrainians are working to find that evidence, with visual teams sifting through the damage to try and make a case against Russia at the International Criminal Court. By the way, the U.S. is not part of the International Criminal Court, and the U.S. has used these weapons, according to the Cluster and Landmine Munition Monitor, an international group that tracks this kind of thing, saying the U.S. used cluster bombs in Afghanistan in 2002 and Iraq in 2003. Amnesty International says they were used in 2009 in Yemen. Under former President Trump, the Pentagon indefinitely put off a planned ban on certain cluster bombs. The Human Rights Watch is calling on the Biden administration to change that policy. So we are quickly approaching a horrific number, nearly 2 million refugees that have left Ukraine just since this invasion began a matter of days ago. And according to the U.N., half that number, they're just kids, including one girl, Arena. She's seven years old. This is her. She just celebrated her birthday at this, like, camp for refugees in a Romanian border town. Take a look at what that was like. Happy For a little girl just seven years old, Romania's Interior Ministry is saying they hope Irina can celebrate her next birthday at home. Kelly Kobiaya joins me now. And Kelly, you know, it's not just Irina, that little girl. There's so many kids getting displaced by this war. And you have to think about the impact that that has, you know, on a generation of kids. Yeah, I mean, when we're talking about more than half a million, presumably three quarters of a million kids who are now displaced, those are UNICEF figures. They don't have an exact number, but they do say that half, as you mentioned, of the displaced people right now, of the refugees, are children. So we're looking at this incredible number, and we talked to, we've talked to a lot of these kids in the past few days. We spoke to an 11-year-old girl a couple days ago who uh, had been traveling for about more than 24 hours with her mom and sisters and and friends of uh, uh, family friends and she said she was she heard what she thought was fireworks one night and the next morning mom woke her up and said pack your bag we got to go and it was just that quick um, sh she seemed fairly resilient but she's 11 years old and and you know thinking about how this is going to play out long term is completely different and we also spoke to a, a mom of two young children about what she's seen uh, as she traveled from Ukraine into Poland. Take a listen. They're uh, too little to understand what's happening around them. And I think it's good because I see uh, that uh, people, uh, children uh, of older age are very scared. You know, a lot of these children, imagine parents are having to explain to these children what's going on. They're having to explain what war is, why uh, their fathers and grandfathers have been left behind. So really, really traumatic. And we're only seeing the very beginning of the impact of this on these children. Hallie. 
You know, Kelly, I had a chance to speak with a spokesperson for the U.N. Refugee Agency who talked about what they are seeing now over the last few days are, are folks coming across the border who are increasingly traumatized and increasingly vulnerable, who may not have had the means that others have had earlier on in this crisis, and spoke to the, like, just huge logistical need that exists right now, right, organizationally, and just trying to basically scale up to help the, the, the vast number of people that are in now places like where you are, in Poland and in other countries along Ukraine's border. Yeah, and we were speaking to some folks who work with the, some of the bigger volunteer organizations and charitable organizations, and they said we are starting to get overwhelmed because we're seeing these people, these families who don't have friends and family in Poland and other parts of Europe. They don't have a place to go. They don't have someone to call. Uh, they can't just pick up and relocate. And as we've been saying over and over again, they're coming with nothing, like the, the mother, Larissa, whose who's soundbite you just heard. She's one of these people. She she came to Poland not knowing anyone. She was traveling with a couple of people who do apparently know someone in Poland, but they were held up at the border because they weren't traveling with young children. She didn't even know where the bus was, which bus to take to the processing center. I mean, and there are loads, there are thousands of volunteers at these border crossings to help people and to give them the information that they need to get to the next step. But, Hallie, I guess the point is people are coming very traumatized, not knowing very much, not having anything with yeah. them. And they're having to navigate this incredibly chaotic scene and get themselves and their children to the ne next stage where, where they are sheltered. Now, the central government in Poland is trying to coordinate sort of a centralized response, and that's ongoing as we speak. But again, because it's happened so quickly, it hasn't happened in uh, the response hasn't happened in a, in a controlled way. Kelly Kobiei, alive for us there in Poland. Kelly, thank you for that reporting. Still coming up here on this show, more student protests in Florida about the so-called Don't Say Gay bill that the state Senate is voting on today. We've got more on that in the local. And nearly two years into this pandemic, we're still asking ourselves and starting to ask ourselves, what does the new normal look like? In an exclusive, Kate Snow goes inside the CDC for a check. She's got our backstory next. Friends and family are demanding that Brittany Griner be released after we learned the WNBA player had been arrested in Russia. But it may not be easy to get her back home. We've got more on this story a little bit later. But first, NBC News covers hundreds of stories every day. And because you couldn't possibly read or watch or listen to them all, our bureau teams have done it for you. This is what they tell us is going down in their regions in a segment we call The Local. From our Southeast Bureau, Florida's Senate is voting on what critics call the Don't Say Gay Bill right now. And it looks like they have enough support to pass it. That means it goes to the governor's desk to be signed into law. As we've told you before, this is a bill that would stop classrooms from talking about things like sexual orientation and gender identity to a degree. Students all across the state were protesting the bill in Tallahassee. They made their way to the Capitol this morning. Also from our Southeast Bureau, the country's biggest pediatric hospital, says it will stop gender-affirming therapies. Texas Children's Hospital in Houston announced its decision after the governor ordered the state to investigate reports of gender-confirming care as child abuse. The hospital says it wants to create a healthier future for all children, quote, within the bounds of the law. And out of our Midwest Bureau, Chicago's polar plunge made its pandemic comeback. That's right. Who doesn't want to strip down and dip into some icy waters? North Avenue Beach, wintertime tradition, right? All for a good cause. It raises money to support Special Olympics athletes. They hadn't done it because of COVID, but this year they brought in $1.6 million. Time now to get the backstory. Our behind the scenes look at how a story comes together and how it fits into our bigger picture. And tonight, we're getting exclusive access to the CDC. What does the new normal look like? Where are we with herd immunity? What about new variants? You are looking at, of course, our Kate Snow talking with scientists and the agency's director, Dr. Rochelle Walensky. They showed us things like a map where they look at the impact of COVID in the U.S. Green is good. It means low total cases, low strain on hospitals. Yellow is medium. Orange is high. And guess what? We're seeing more of the yellow, more of the green, which is why you're seeing more and more restrictions being lifted. Kate also had a chance. That's that map right there, by the way. Kate also had a chance to follow Dr. Walensky to a federally funded clinic 
in St. Louis, where she talked about the future and what the future looks like in a world where COVID exists. Watch. I do anticipate that this is probably going to be a seasonal virus. It may be seasonal around the time other respiratory viruses thrive. So that the would be the flu is the way the flu is. I want to bring in now Kate Snow. And Kate, we're so glad to have you with us for this special segment. And our, our viewers uh, will happy know. Happy to be here. Well, listen, we want to go behind the scenes. How did you get this story? What was it like for you reporting on it? And right now, it's such an interesting time because all across the country, like in D.C. where I am, mask mandates are lifting. Right. You're seeing cases go down. When you are walking into an interview like this, and I know, listen, you don't have all the time in the world. They're not giving you six weeks at the CDC. What is your, like, <laughs> right. reporting pursuit and priority? Yeah. Oh, so interesting. So number one, we kind of went at this thinking, where do we go to get the biggest, right? Who's who's accountable? Who's the person in charge of really our COVID response? We could have gone to the National Institutes of Health in Washington. We chose to go to the CDC in Atlanta. They were good to us. They let us come in. You're seeing, seeing their emergency operations center there. They let us go in there. If you notice, Hallie, there's not a lot of people in there yeah. besides us. That's because they're still working from home, too, just like the rest of, of the world. Um, but really, we wanted to tackle, as you said, the big questions like, where are we right now in this pandemic? Is it still a pandemic? Are we in the endemic phase that everybody keeps talking about? And the short answer is they think much of the country, you showed that map before, there's a lot of green. There are a lot of places yeah. that have very low uh, caseloads right now and low hospitalizations. And that's all really, really positive news. You you don't just snap your fingers, Kate, and get this kind of, you know, ability to see inside the CDC. You have been reporting on this pandemic for two plus years yeah. at this point. I have to imagine that, you know, you were able to rely on kind of your expertise and your reporting on this to be able to talk with these officials. Well, yeah, I, I do a lot of homework, too, as I know you do, too, Hallie. Um, I would say, also say Lauren Dunn, if I could shout out. She's a, a medical a unit producer out. here. She is fantastic. She really set up and, you know, made all the calls to the CDC and got our access um, after we thought it up and said, this is what we need to do. We need to go inside. Um, but Dr. Walensky, I had interviewed before once, and this is a true story. She's a big fan of NBC News, and she's a big fan of Nightly News in particular, and actually, like, watches the show that I anchor every Sunday night, <laughs> um, Nightly News. So, so it was kind of funny. At the very end, she asked if we could take a picture, and, you know, because like, she wanted to show her husband <laughs> that she'd been with me in St. Louis. But look, it, it was a serious topic, and I did do a lot of homework to kind of really try to press all these uh, officials that I talked with. We, we ended up doing three different interviews, Dr. Walensky in St. Louis and two others in Atlanta, um, and, and asking a lot about where we are, which is we're in a good place, but is it perfect? No. Can we let our guard down completely? No. Can we take the masks off? Right. Yes, depending on where you live. Uh, the, one, of the, one of the lines that really sticks with me, Hallie, is Dr. Walensky said to me, take the masks and put them in a drawer. But don't throw them away. That's probably good advice for everybody. You know, was there anything, Kate, that you heard or saw in the course of this reporting that surprised you that you didn't expect to see her here? Well, I didn't realize um, the, the administration actually admits this in their report they put out last week, that they were really woefully unprepared at the CDC about a year ago in terms of monitoring and collecting data for a new variant, right? If a new variant pops up in the U.S., Will they actually find it? Um, and I was able to talk to Dr. Walensky about that. Th they say, the CDC says, that it is now incredibly more prepared than it was a year ago because they're doing genomic sequencing at a level they weren't doing before. So they can actually sequence the virus and find new variants. Uh, take a listen to, to an exchange we had about the future. If you were a betting person, Dr. Walensky, <laughs> would you would you think that we're likely to have more variants, or is it just um, impossible to say? It is impossible to say. Um, I, we can decrease our chances by getting more and more people vaccinated, um, and in fact, I think we will see more variants. The real question is, how much impact will they have on us? So there's that uncertainty, Hallie. We will see more variants. Yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me. We just don't know what they look like. Kate Snow, it is great reporting. So many of us enjoy watching you on Sunday nights on Nightly News. And we'll look for more <laughs> tonight um, on NBC Nightly News with Lester at 630 Eastern. Kate, thank you so much. So listen, we've got some breaking news in just the last couple of minutes from the Supreme Court. Different breaking news than what we talked about. And it's this. They are not going to give emergency appeals to Republicans in North Carolina or Pennsylvania who wanted to block plans to redraw the state's congressional districts. 
Why? Well, in the Pennsylvania case, the justices said the appeal is just too soon, since the issue is now in front of a lower federal court. In the North Carolina case, three conservative justices wanted the court to take it up. But again, our Pete Williams tells us the court probably thought the emergency appeal came too late. Coming up on this show after the break, a WNBA star arrested in Russia, allegedly on drug charges. Now, Brittany Griner's family and friends are very worried about how long it'll take to get her back home. We've got the latest on this from today, right after the break. White House Press Secretary Jen Psaki saying just this afternoon, the Biden administration is doing everything they can to help WNBA star Brittany Griner after she was arrested in Russia last month, allegedly on drug charges. Russian customs officials say they found vape cartridges with hash oil in her luggage. Could mean up to 10 years in prison there. And you know fans are getting worried, given everything that's going on with Russia right now about how Griner is doing. And look at this Instagram post from her wife thanking people for their support during what she calls one of the weakest moments of her life. She's also acknowledging, yeah, people want more details about Griner's status, but right now she's asking for privacy. Morgan Chesky joins me, Morgan Chesky rather, sorry, Morgan joins me now from Dallas, because Morgan, I was already thinking about like how many questions there are on this, right? Because the first one that I think people have is, well, wait a second, this arrest happened weeks ago. We're just hearing about it now. How does that compute? And that's a huge question right now, Hallie, because we don't know exactly when this arrest actually took place. We just know that it was made official by Russian officials over the weekend. Those officials came from that Shermyayhov airport. That's where uh, Griner was taken into custody, uh, allegedly for having those cartridges containing that hash oil inside her bag that, as you mentioned, carries a fine of up to 10 years in prison. A friend of Griner's has posted online that she believes it's been about three Three weeks since that arrest has taken place. Uh, important to know, we don't know exactly where Griner is at right. this point in time, other than uh, being detained, which the Russian authorities have confirmed. Uh, however, we do know that the WNBA, Griner's agent, uh, have said that they are in close contact uh, with Griner's Russian representation uh, and officials as they try to sort out this uh, incredibly uh, growing, uh, growingly intense ordeal here uh, with she now the last WNBA be a player uh, either in Ukraine or in Russia. Everyone else who is playing overseas, Hallie, has since returned to the United States. That's according to the WNBA. And let me give folks some context on this because, you know, oftentimes, sometimes these WNBA players will go play overseas because, you know, they are able to do so. They can make some money doing that, right? There is a, a, a big international following for women's professional basketball in other countries. Yeah, there's a big international following, and there's, frankly, is a massive gap uh, in the income you can make, whether it's playing in the WNBA or playing overseas. Uh, most of the max contracts in the WNBA here in the U.S. tap out around $200,000. For the last seven seasons playing for this Russian team, Griner was bringing home about a million dollars uh, every season. So you can see it's almost quadruple the amount that you can make uh, playing a season here in the United States. And she yeah, is far from the only one uh, playing overseas right, right now. Uh, we are waiting to see just what, if anything, will happen. We have heard from Secretary of State Blinken, who's saying that uh, he is aware of an American abroad. But because this is of such a sensitive nature, uh, he's unable to divulge any uh, crucial details at this point in time. That sentiment echoed uh, in that Instagram post uh, from Griner's uh, wife, who said, that while she appreciates all the support, uh, she's asking for privacy at this time. A lot of Allie. people, uh, for sure, looking at Brittany Griner, hoping she's in, in a safe place and that she gets home soon. Morgan Chesky, thank you very much for your reporting. And thanks to you all for being with us on this busy hour. We're going to have more for you tomorrow. Same time, same place. Coverage picks up right now. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.